Do you feel like the odds are stacked against you to be able to start a business and achieve financial freedom? Well, take it from our guest today, Alex Bradley, who actually had a kid in college and you think student loans are bad. He then had to automatically care for himself and his actual girlfriend and his new baby. And that was actually a task that drove him to earn more money. And he started looking into side hustles. He found out about wholesaling real estate. He actually did his first deal and made $7,000. And now that he's four years into this journey, talks about what real estate's allowed him to do and sharing the best practices that he's learned along the way. If you've gotten any value from this podcast so far, please drop us a review. It helps us make more content to get you on the path to financial freedom. The Deal Machine REI Podcast. Everything you need to know to get started in real estate investing. All right, everybody, we're here at the Deal Machine Real Estate Investing Podcast, where we help you escape your nine to five, get your first wholesale deal and live life on your own terms. We've got a special guest today. You guys aren't going to believe this, Alex Bradley, who's been in the game for four years, and he's got a great story, and he's just figuring out what really works to scale up his business. So I can't wait for him to tell you that story. Alex, you've done about 50 deals now, but can you bring us back to doing that very first deal back in 2019? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first one is kind of a funny story. So um, I had started out, I first heard about wholesaling like the summer of 2018. I was working a full-time job. I just graduated college and um, I had a kid in college actually. And so I'm at this point where I'm supporting a family of three in San Diego off of one income and we're just barely scraping by. So I was looking for different side hustles and ways to just figure out how do we support our family here in San Diego. And I came across this blog. Um, it was called Side Hustle Nation. And there was a post about this guy doing wholesaling. I don't even think it was called wholesaling back then. He just kind of explained what it was. Um, it wasn't as mainstream as it is now. So honestly, I spent the first like six months just um, you know, listening to bigger pockets, podcasts and stuff like that. I was actually working two jobs already. I had my full-time job and then I was also working as a server at a restaurant for like 30 hours a week. So it's pretty busy. And then, um, in December, 2018, my second kid was born. My son, Elijah was born. And so I had this period of time where I was able to go on maternity leave and I had about three months and I was like, all right, this is my time. You know, I, I don't have any work that I need to do. I'm not, you know, in a full-time job plus the um, side job at the restaurant. This is like basically the only time I have to be able to make something work. And um, funny enough, I actually didn't believe wholesaling was going to work. I thought it was too good to be true. And um, so I actually started to do this completely other side hustle of selling advertising for a magazine. I even went out to Denver to do this training. And my plan was to sell ads in this magazine so that I could buy myself enough financial or like time and financial freedom to then attempt to do wholesaling. So I went to Denver, I did this training, I came back and then I started cold calling for this magazine. And after like day two, I was like, this sucks. I absolutely hate this. Like there's no way wholesaling can be worse than this. And so totally threw the advertisement sales to the side. And uh, when my son was three weeks old, my wife and I, we, we got a list from a title company, pre foreclosures, and we started door knocking all over San Diego. We dropped my daughter off at school um, in the morning and we'd have like three hours where we could take uh, my son, who was three weeks old at the time, drive around San Diego. We'd walk up to the door with him in our arms and we would just knock on the door and say like, hey, you know, we're um, a local real estate investor. We saw your house on this list, wanted to see if we could help you out. Um, and then in between that, um, you know, we'd go knock on door and then she'd have to feed him. And so my first deal, sorry, that's kind of like a, a long story, but kind of coming up to it here. My first deal came from somebody that I cold called on that list. We were, uh, we just finished door knocking a house. We were going to go to another one before we had to pick up my daughter. And I, I'm just cold calling this list that was skip traced and I'm on my phone. I don't have a dialer. I don't have anything. I'm like copying and pasting from some spreadsheet on my phone. I called this guy and I left a voicemail for him. He had a house that was in pre-foreclosure in Chula Vista, just like South San Diego. And he called me back like two days later because I left him a voicemail and he said, hey, I want to sell. Um, so I set up an appointment with him to meet him. And the house that he had to sell um, was actually not even in San Diego. It was in San Antonio. He had a rental property out there that he wanted to sell in order to save his home 
from being foreclosed on in San Diego. And so, you know, not knowing anything, um, I was like, yeah, sure, we can do that. Of course, I'd love to buy a house in San Antonio. And at this point, like, I, that's basically all I knew how to do, right? Was like, talk to somebody, plug in the 75% or 70% of ARV minus rehab minus assignment fee. Like I could do that formula. I had a contract and um, I could get it signed. And then at that point, after that, I was like, I have no idea what to do. I've just been listening to bigger pockets. Mm. And so I've started scrambling and I just sort of called uh, cold calling escrow companies or in Texas, it's title companies. And I was like, Hey, I have this contract. I want to wholesale it. Can you help me out? And they're like, do you want title insurance? And I was like, oh, I don't want to pay for anything. I was like, I don't, I don't know. Like, not really. And they're like, All right, well, if you don't want title insurance, then you can't do the, the deal. And I was like, okay, then I want title insurance. Like, of course. And so um, that was my first deal. And literally every single step of the way, I had, I just like would call the title company every single day. Like, what's next? What do we need to do? And we ended up having to get like an affidavit of airship. Uh, because his wife had died and we, you know, had to do a lot of these steps that like literally every single step of the way was just like figuring it out. And um, that deal closed, I think from like the first day we started cold, cold calling and door knocking to that closing was like three weeks. And so that wow, was three weeks. That's yeah. nuts. Yeah. It was, it was and like right crazy. away. It was, it was like day two of like cold calling and door knocking that I made that call. Then he called me back like two days later. And then we went to escrow. And that one was also crazy too. So uh, come to find out, we were like a week into escrow on that one. And the buyer called me. He's like, hey, I just noticed this property's on auction.com and it's going to auction in like three days. And so we had to scramble to like close even sooner and rush the payoff. Uh, but a bunch of other stuff happened with that one. He like tried ghosting me at the very end and like wasn't signing what he needed to sign. And so I had to go like mm -hmm. knock on his door a bunch of times. Um, and it was really awkward. Um, that was the seller. That was the seller. Yeah. He lived like 20 oh. minutes from me. And I remember like, um, going to his house and like trying to get him to answer the door. And I could see through the little window that he was like laying down on his couch in the living room, but he wasn't coming to the door. And so I literally, I was like, man, this is, I made like seven grand on this deal. And to me at that time was like the most money I've ever had in my life. And I was like, yeah. I got seven grand on the line. And I stood at his door and knocked on his door for like 30 minutes until he finally got up and came to the door. And then we were able to um, get the signatures and everything that we needed. So that was my first ever deal. That was back in January slash February of 2019. And yeah, I just came from good old cold calling and, and door knocking and um, doing what we had to do. Alex, what's so incredible about your story is people think student loans are bad. You actually had a baby in college. So you're paying for more than your own college education, right? And so it's like, man, money was tight and time was tight if you had those responsibilities to go ahead and start doing something like this. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, at that time, I had a two-year-old and a newborn, you know, literally three weeks old. So, you know, we were barely scraping by when it was the three of us. And all of a sudden, I'm the sole provider for a family of four. And um, yeah, I mean, my wife and I, we graduated college together. Our daughter was born a few weeks before we started our senior year. And the plan, of course, was both of us to go into corporate and to, you know, just be making good money after college. And we would have been fine. You know, just the two of us, dual income, like, you know, young kids, we would have been living great here in San Diego. But things happen. We ended up um, having a kid our senior year and we went from, you know, looking like that to, all right, now we have one income for a whole family here. And it was tough for mm -hmm. sure. But if it wasn't for that happening, I probably would have just stayed in corporate, climbed the corporate ladder. And I knew that's, I knew even back then, that's not what I wanted to do. I always wanted to be into some kind of entrepreneurship and having a kid forced us into that, you know, even sooner than we imagined. Gotcha. What do you think the difference in your life would be if you went corporate versus now? Well, versus now, it would be completely different. It would just be a nine to five. Um, it's hard to say. I Like I said, I have always wanted to do entrepreneurship, but I think it would have been a lot scarier to leap and to get away from the corporate ladder, whereas I was forced to do that. So, I mean, today I work from home. I make my own schedule. I can take my kids to school in the mornings. I can go on field trips with them. You know, if I want to take a day off early and just go to the beach and hang out with them, I can do that. So 
you know, with the nine to five, I'm, I'm not able to do that. Last year, my daughter was in first grade. She had several like school performances that are just in the middle of the day. You know, normally I'd be having to request PTO and like ask my manager, please, can I have this day off so I can go watch my daughter's performance? You know, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's a privilege to not have to do those things as a parent and, you know, just as an entrepreneur. So uh, I'm definitely blessed to be able to have the freedom that we have now. That's awesome. amazing that you're able to attend your daughter's activities. And it is nice not having to ask permission. That's really great. Yeah. It's a great feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, going back to the getting getting your deal, how how did you estimate your rehab costs? What was the the method that you used then on that first transaction to to get an estimate of what renovations was going to be? Um, so I'm pretty sure I used the buyer for that. I had got it locked up. Actually, no, I didn't. I had started calling people before I got it locked up. So I had the address already and I had a couple of days before we were going to meet and go over the contract. And so I actually got banned on bigger pockets or I got like suspended on bigger pockets because I DM'd every single person that had landlord in their bio that was in San sure. Antonio. That's how I found my first buyer. Um, I found this guy who was from Riverside, like Southern California, and he was stationed out in San Antonio. He was in the military and he was looking to buy his first rental. And so, um, I found that guy and I think I sent him to the house to do a walkthrough. Uh, we ended up, I, I think I had to get a like slight price reduction on it. Even before I got the contract signed, I had told the guy like a a ballpark. And then I was on the phone with the guy as he was walking through the house. I was sitting in the living room with the seller on the phone with the buyers. He's walking through the house and the buyer just told us like what we needed the price to be at. And so the seller was right there and I was like, look, this, this is what we're looking at. This is my, you know, contractor that's walking through the house right now. And, um, this is how much it's going to cost. So it was just totally leveraging other people. What about now when you get a deal, what's your strategies in estimating rehab costs? Now is a little bit different because I don't do much direct to seller. Um, I mostly focus on dispo. So my acquisitions are more like working with real estate agents that have pocket listings or working with other wholesalers who already have deals that are locked up. So I I do have like a uh, max allowable offer calculator that I will use. And I just plug the ARV in there and it's got a breakdown of like how much the rehab would be if it's a light fixer, a medium fixer, or a heavy fixer, and then based on the square footage of the property. So I'm mostly using that. Um, and just being in it so long, I can kind of estimate like what stuff is going to cost based on just photos. Um, but one of the things that I do on Dispo, because every time I sell a property or I market a property, the buyers are always asking, you know, what's the ARV? What's the rehab estimate? What are the comps? And I tell every single buyer for every deal that I have, um, look, that's your job to do the due diligence. And it's our company policy not to give our opinion on what the ARV is or what the rehab estimate is or, you know, even send comps. And we do that because we... Does that give you... Does that provide a, a little bit of a barrier though? Like for your buyers or are your buyers okay with that? You would think so. I was definitely like scared when I first like started doing that. Um, but I've had out of the last like almost two years that I've stuck to this policy, I've had one person like really get upset about it. And he was from New Western. You know, he was a guy that was just like wanted me to do his job for him. So I just, I just tell everyone like, yeah. hey, it's, you know, if the reason why we do it is because we've had so many just like petty arguments with people over the years where it's like, you know, you tell them a rehab estimate or an ARV and you can tell five different people, you know, this is what I have for the rehab estimate. And, and they'll argue. they're all going to argue. They're all, or you ask five different people, Hey, what do you think ARV is? Or what do you think the rehab estimate is? And they're all going to give you a different answer. So there's no yeah. way. And then either way, right. Even if like, you guys don't have that argument, they're still going to go and run their own numbers. So I just tell people right mm -hmm. off the bat, Hey, you know, we just ask all of our buyers to like do your own due diligence and let us know like where you need to be at. Like what are the, what does the price need to be at for this to make sense for you? And every single time I swear to God, people are just like, Oh, totally get it. I, I respect that. Like, I, I think if anything, people respect it more if you have a policy and you stick to it and, and they understand because you know, 
especially when it comes to rehab estimate. I think that's the big one. Everyone's got yeah. a different contract. Well, and ARV too. ARV too, but like for for rehab, if you think about it, people have different contractors. People are using different materials. The price is going to be mm-hmm. different for every single person flipping that house. And so, yeah, we just tell yeah. them like, hey, you know, here's all of the photos that I can provide you that we just got taken. So we're doing that step for you. And then we'll give you a walkthrough, but it's it's your job to figure out how much this is going to cost. I'm a wholesaler. I've never rehabbed a property. Yeah. I've never flipped a property. I'm not a contractor. Why are you asking me what it's going to cost to rehab this price? Right. You know what I mean? Like I can guess, I can use this calculator that I found on the internet, but is that how you want to underwrite this deal that you're going to buy? Please open up your podcast app right now and leave us a review and let us know what you thought of this episode. It means so much because the reviews help us get in front of more people. And the more people we can get in front of, the more we can help them achieve financial freedom. And we also get more energy to put more content out like this to help you. So by leaving us a review, it will give you more content to come to help you along in your journey. Thank you so much. Right. So you're avoiding arguments because you realize everyone has a different ARV and rehab estimate. So you let them calculate those things rather than you publishing what you think those things are. Yeah, absolutely. Totally avoid the arguments. And then it, it also helps me to like, sometimes I will tell people, you know, well, based on the uh, you know conversations that I've had with other buyers on this property, they're thinking rehab is going to be in this range, you know? So I'm, yeah. And- well, and it makes sense too, because some people put in for Mica countertops, other people might put in granite countertops. There's Absolutely. a difference in price with both of those materials. So I get exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Some people like, are doing the, you know, handiwork themselves and right. they're not hiring a crew. So it's it's there's such a huge variable there. It doesn't make sense for me to tell somebody how much it's gonna cost them to fix up a property. Yeah. Why do you think that guy was ghosting you? And I know that you persisted because you had seven thousand dollars on the line, but if his house was going to be auctioned off in a couple of days, like why do you think he was yeah. ghosting you when, when you were offering him a solution? There were some issues there that we kind of figured out towards the end. Um, he wasn't fully there mentally. We actually ended mm-hmm. up having to bring in his niece who lived with him to like help us complete the transaction. Um, but I, I think there was some dementia there actually that was going on. Um, and so I don't know the full reason, but we're guessing it had something to do with that. Gotcha. Okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. So talk to me about your story because I know you, you didn't succeed right at first, right? You said you actually, I know you've said you, you had to actually go get, get a job again, right? Even though you quit your job full time to do this. Yeah. So like I said, first deal was beginning of 2019 and it was a side hustle for the first two years. I was working my full-time job, was working the restaurant job. And then um, my first like few deals or for the first year, most of my deals were coming from Facebook ads. Um, And then in the, I think it was November, 2020, I left my full-time job and went full-time into wholesaling. And so basically all of 2021, I was just full-time wholesaler and I absolutely fell on my face. Um, And the main reason was I, I realized like, I hate acquisitions. Like the direct to seller part of the business is just not my thing. And so I did a couple of deals in 2021, but um, really just not enough to get by. I ended up like burning through my savings. And then in like August or September, I had to go back and get a job working as a server again at a restaurant. And um, at that time, I was, my wife had just gotten licensed that summer and she was doing really good. And I was like, all right, I'm going to get licensed. I'm going to do exactly what you're doing. We'll work the retail side of the business for a little while until I can build that savings back up and then relaunch a wholesaling business. That was the plan. And then in December of 2021, um, a buddy of mine had, was posting on his Instagram. I met him at a, a mastermind and he was looking for a disco guy. And I was like, all right, you know, that seems interesting. And so um, hit him up, we had a conversation and I ended up joining another wholesaling company to just run Dispo for them. So that was in December, 2021. Um, And then by like January, I was able to, January, February, I was able to quit the restaurant job and just do Dispo full time. So that was, that was probably like the biggest shift that I've had since starting wholesaling. 
um, is realizing that I really like the dispo side of it. And it's not even really the dispo that I like more. It's the B2B relationship with the people that I'm working with. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're doing direct to seller acquisitions, that's B2C, you know, direct to the consumer or the seller on that property. And there's just so much drama that comes from that. And I just don't enjoy it at all. Like for me, if I'm talking okay. to buyers, you know, it's, it's about the numbers. It's just, you know, no so one's going to only disposit. Do you only sell deals now? I only do. I do like a tiny bit of my own acquisitions, but very okay. little. Like, all, well, where do you find the deals that people actually? Where do you find the deals that you sell? Um, well, I've been in real estate for, or I've been in wholesaling now for a few years. So a lot of people just know me. Um, I've just connected with a lot of different people, and so a lot of my deals are just coming in. Like, I've got other wholesalers and other real estate agents that call me. Um, just about every day with like a new deal that they want to wholesale. I've also wow. found that because of this kind of shift that we've had in the market for the last like nine months, I've even had a lot of buyers that I've been talking to for the last couple of years. Um, they're now calling me and saying, Hey, I know you're a wholesaler. Like, can you dispo this deal that I have locked up that I'm, you know, don't want to close on or this deal that I just bought instead of rehabbing it, I want to sell it. And so I'll do that as well. Got it. So you've got like a big buyers list. Yeah, I use Investor Lift for Dispo. Um, so you know they've they've got a huge list. I'm I want to try and step away from that a little bit, but for now it it works really well. Gotcha. Why do you want to step away from it? I just want more control over my own data. You know, like you can't. You're able to like build your own list in the in the system. People that sign up for your deals. You can build this huge list that's, you know, your list, but you're not allowed to export any of that data. Um, and data is, you know, so important. So I, I want to be able to just have more control of my own data. Gotcha. Okay. With your, when you're doing this, so essentially it's JV deals with other wholesalers bringing them to you. Do you mark up or do you split the assignment fee? Most of the time it's a split. Um, if someone's already marketing a deal, I don't, like to put my fee on top of it because it confuses the market yeah. when people are getting you know there's going to be crossover of people's buyers list every single time and so right. when a buyer is it. getting an email mm -hmm. for a deal at four different prices i just think it's yeah. it's tacky and so i think that's good yeah. yeah i just i just put it at the same mm -hmm. one and if i need to mark it up i'll have that conversation on the phone with the buyer and say hey i'm working with another guy on this it's a jv deal in order for us to make this work for you, we need to mark this up like five or 10 K, you know, or like, you know, or yeah. we, you know, I'm JVing this and he, the guy that's got it, he's got a few offers at this asking price already. So in order for me to make, you know, win this deal for you, I kind of like turn into like, Hey, I'm, I'm your representative, right? Like I'm working for the buyer trying to win this deal for you, almost like an agent would. So I'm like, Hey, if you want this deal, he's got other offers on the table. We need to be at like five to 10 K over. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm glad the thing that I love about this the most, Alex, is that you figured out what aspects of the business you liked the best. And then you got rid of the parts that you didn't like. You got rid yeah. of it, not by hiring staff, but you actually work with other wholesalers in your industry that know you that uh, find the deals, right? And then they bring them right to you. So that's fantastic. So it's that like, makes it a lot easier, like significantly less to overhead. If you get to a point where you have them bringing you deals, you have no overhead in terms of having to market for properties. Yes, yeah. absolutely. My overhead is investor lift. It's and that's it. What's what's investor lift do and what's it cost? It costs three grand a month um, for the like level that I have. I think there's a few different levels, but basically it just gives you access to nationwide cash buyers list. I think at this point they've got a few million buyers, like five or six million buyers. Uh, don't quote me on that, just across the nation. So, um, you know, you can, you upload a deal and you're able to email and text blast any deal that you get anywhere in the country. And you can send it to up to like 25,000 buyers at a time. Um, and it's, they've got buyers, they've got wholesalers, they've got real estate agents, and you can filter out who you want to send your deal to. Um, but it's, it really is the most robust buyers list out there. And if you have a deal and you post it on there, you're, you're going to sell and it's going to sell quickly. Wow. 
How about the consistency of deals? If you don't have a plan for acquisition, do you ever get to a point where you don't have deals coming in? I haven't. Um, I mean, so I've, I went independent again in April. Um, I was working as the dispo guy for that other company from end of 2021 to April of this year. And so really even just since like, going into Penn, I haven't had that issue. My issue in the beginning was like, I was on investor lift when I was doing dispo for the other company. And then when I went independent, I was like, uh, you know, I don't know if I can fork out the money for it by myself, like right off the bat. And so I was trying to find other systems that I can use to market my deals. Cause I ended up getting a ton of data. Um, I, somebody scraped some data and hooked me up and I had like, 130,000 buyers, um, emails and phone numbers in Texas. And then I had another like 10,000 in Southern California, but I couldn't find an email platform that would let me upload the data and start marketing to it. Cause I didn't have proof of opt-in. And so, um, I had to go back to using investor lift, but that was my struggle in the beginning. I had deals that were coming in and I just couldn't market to them, um, until I went back to using investor lift. Uh, but in the beginning, mm -hmm. like if I'm ever, you know, if, if I'm have nothing on the board right now that I'm actively trying to sell, I'll go into Facebook and just hop in a few of these Facebook groups and, um, just start reaching out to people that are posting their deals and I can easily get another, you know, one to two deals in just a couple hours of scrolling Facebook groups and, and finding something. Yeah. Love it. That's good. What's the process of marketing on investor lift? Like, how how long does it take you to dispo a deal from that? It depends on how good the deal is. If it's a good deal, I can sell it within an hour. Like literally, it's that good. Gotcha. Um, if it's something that's a little bit tighter, then you know there's there's a feature on there where you can look at all of the data in that area. You can draw a radius around that house, and you can look for mm -hmm. like cash transactions. Um, and you can cold call through there. And then you can also just call like the top buyers in that area that have like that geolocation as a tag on their profile. So you can cold call. I honestly haven't been doing much of that um, since it's just JV deals. Like, I don't know. I almost feel bad saying this, but I've kind of just taken the approach of where I'll just post everything that I can on investor lift and I'm just kind of throwing everything at the wall and whatever sticks sells, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. And so I'm just, I'm not really spending any time cold calling, you know, I'll, I'll post a deal on there. And if it doesn't sell, I'll just let the wholesaler know like, Hey, we, we put it up there. This is the feedback that we got on it because people will inquire. You'll have conversations on every property and you'll figure out where you need to be at and how far off we are. Um, and so I just throw, I put everything on there. I blast it out and then I wait for the inbound to come in. I wait for people to call me, text me, email me about the deal. And if I get enough interest on it, I'll sell it. Yeah, that's good. I mean, you really, that's, you're really at no risk with this dispo form. Like you're getting deals, throwing them out on investor lift and, and waiting for the buyer to come in. So it's more incentive for sellers or other wholesalers to bring deals to you because you have access to something they don't. Yeah, absolutely. I tell everyone like, Hey, you know, give me a chance just to put it on investor lift and blast it out. And I'll let you know where the offers come in at. You know, it's like, there's no obligation to work specifically yeah. with me. They can still sell the deal on their own, but it's an opportunity to get more offers on the property, get more eyes on their deal and potentially sell it for more than they'd be able to sell it just utilizing their own buyer's list. Yeah. And they'll, they'll gain, you'll gain consistency with them and they'll keep bringing you deals. Exactly. Yeah. I, I get yeah. tons of like repeat wholesalers and agents that are hitting me up. I've got a couple of guys that just focus on acquisitions. I think there's been other wholesalers mm -hmm. um, in the industry that have kind of found the same thing but the opposite, mm -hmm. whereas like for me, I just want to focus on dispo. There's other guys that, you know, they just want to focus on acquisitions because every time they start, they yeah. lock up a property and then they go to dispo it, they're spending a week or two weeks trying to dispo it. And then their pipeline on the acquisition side starts to dry up because you need to mm -hmm. be on yeah. that every single day on acquisitions. And so they're yeah. happy to just outsource dispo to me. And so there's, I've got 
a handful of people that that's all that they do is they lock stuff up and they they outsource the dispo to me amazing i like it well you've given us a master class on dispositions what's real estate awesome. allowed for you to do that you wouldn't be doing otherwise right if you had that nine to five freedom for sure i mean it's it's pretty simple for me like i said it really just goes back to like being able to spend time with the kids and stuff like that and you know, as as we grow everything, there's going to be more opportunities that open up um, the relationships that I've been able to build with other investors out there. I know it's going to open up the opportunity for me to start being able to get to that next level, you know, buying rentals, getting into um, I don't know if I really want to do fix and flips in this market, but just being able to do bigger projects with people, um, the connections that I've been able to make. Definitely, I think coming from a corporate world and trying to get into that, I don't really know if that would be possible. All right, now I've got a personal question. I know you're a skateboarder and I've been getting into wake surfing, right? Which seems kind of similar. You're like board skills, doing flips and stuff. But when I wipe out, it doesn't hurt. How the heck did you learn skateboarding and still live to tell about it? I can't imagine wiping out on skate parks and concrete. It hurts so much. It's funny that you asked that um, because I was like, that's that was my life in high school. And um, I joke about it with a couple of my buddies that I still like skate with now, whereas like in high school, man, we would throw ourselves down these like stair sets for hours at a time trying to land a trick. I would spend like six hours just eating it over and over and over again. And the next day it would be like nothing. And it's like now if I hit a rock while I'm skating and I, and I fall over, man, I'm sore for like days afterwards. So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's, it's terrible. Um, I just bought a new skateboard last week. Um, cause a couple of my buddies were like really pressuring me to go hang out with them and, and skate. So I, it's not something I'm like doing every day, like I was back in high school, but, um, it's, it's fun to go out and I like to, my kids are always outside. So like they'll have their bikes and their scooters and their little, um, like battery operated Jeep thing. And so I'll just like yeah. cruise around with them on my skateboard and, and just like, you know, all the up and down curbs and like little stuff. I'm not doing anything like I was, you know, back in high school, but it, it still hurts. And it hurts a lot more when I fall. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm glad you're still at it though. And congrats on the new board. Yeah. Yeah. It's so exciting let, let for me, sure. If somebody's listening to this and, and they have a deal, but they want to get rid of it, do you actually work in California and San Antonio only, or like, do you have uh, ge uh, geography that you like to do deals in? So technically with investor lift, we can go nationwide. It makes it really, really easy to just like go into any new market because there's already a, a set like buyers list there and buyers yeah. don't care where the deal is coming from. If they've talked yeah. to you before or not, if you send them a smoking deal, they're going to call you about it and they're going to buy it from you. With that being said, there's a few markets that I've done like more deals in. And so I'm more comfortable with that. Anywhere in California, I can sell. I've done a few in New Mexico around Albuquerque. Um, I've done a bunch in Texas, all of the major markets in Texas. And then I've done a few in Louisiana, some in Shreveport, some in New Orleans, some in Baton Rouge. So those are like the main four states that I'm like pretty confident I can move and I can underwrite deals in those areas a little bit better. But if you've got a smoking deal, um, no matter where it's at, we can sell it. I've sold stuff in the tiniest of towns in Oregon and like just random states that, you know, you wouldn't even think of. There's a couple of states that we can't go into. Nebraska, we posted a deal in Nebraska last year. We got a cease and desist from like the real estate board of directors or whatever their you know real estate board is in nebraska they sent us to cease and desist because we posted a wholesale deal there um so yeah. don't do that um and then i think like illinois i haven't done anything in illinois because they have some pretty strict wholesaling laws got it well if you guys are looking for a buyer hit up alex on instagram i think it's alex dadley is that right yeah, Alex underscore Dadley is my Instagram. I don't post a lot like on my feed, but I post new deals on my stories just about every day. So yeah, definitely hit me up, send me a DM and we can get your deal blasted out and see if we can get you some buyers for it. Amazing. Sweet. Alex, thank you so much. You've been a fantastic awesome. guest and a great story too. Lots of ups and guys. downs and ultimately success. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thanks so much. Appreciate it, guys. Have a good one. All right, you too, man. Thanks for listening to the Deal Machine Real Estate Investing Podcast. 
please leave us a review and follow along wherever you're listening to your podcast.